So I'm going to talk about novel approaches to advanced uh, unresectable melanoma. And I'll, the definition of unresectable melanoma is changing. This is no longer really a technical term because most things are resectable, but not resectable meaningfully for, for, for cure. Um, so um, we'll talk about intralesional oncolytic immunotherapy as it relates to, it relates to melanoma. As an introduction, uh, we'll talk about the spectrum of advanced disease uh, specifically pointing out uh, lesions that are accessible to be injected. So we're talking about patients with intransit disease, pretty unique for melanoma patients, uh, regionally metastatic disease. This is defined as stage 3B or, th or 3C, depending if they have nodal disease or not. Then there's the patients who have distant skin, soft tissue, and nodal metastases. These distant sites are stage, uh, stage 4 M1A, and they're accessible for intralesional injections as well. And uh, both of these would be considered candidates for such type of therapy, either with or without synchronous limited visceral disease. And we'll talk about the concept of limited visceral disease later, but these are the patients who would have, would have, would have more, more advanced disease. So let's kind of focus on the, um, the, the regional cutaneous metastases that we call collectively as in transit metastases that represents either local recurrences, satellite, or in transit disease, initially defined by the distance from the primary tumor, which actually has no biologic import whatsoever, that it's all the same spectrum of disease of regional cutaneous um, uh, metastases that are mostly lymphatic-based. Um, this entity occurs in about 6 to 12 percent of all patients with primary melanomas. The high-risk groups are those patients with thick melanomas, those that are ulcerated and have positive sentinel lymph nodes, and also particularly in the lower extremity, but certainly you can get it on the head and neck region or in the trunk. It's a source of significant um, uh, morbidity, and the other thing related to these patients, even though they mostly present with apparently clinically localized disease, they have greater than a 50% risk of developing distant disease and dying from that at some time in the future. So when we focus on treating these patients, there are two issues to really, to really address. This is the other disease uh, uh, entity, the patients with stage, with um, uh, the soft tissue stage four metastases with or without other non-injectable sites as well. And you can see these lesions are clearly easily injectable. And it brings up the issue about the, the, the management of these patients. There's obviously the issue about local regional disease control because uncontrolled disease is very morbid, while durable control could be curative in some patients. Uh, the other issue is that most of them probably have micrometastatic disease at the, time of, at the time of presentation, and therefore there has to be a discussion about whether to use primary systemic therapy or adjuvant systemic therapy after you've controlled the local disease entity. So from a clinical presentation, uh, most in transit disease is usually recurrent after treatment of the primary, but you can have synchronous pri advanced primary and transit disease at the same time, but most of the time it's recurrent disease. Associated nodal disease is common either before or after. Um, most commonly, as I mentioned, without, distant, without apparent distant synchronous metastatic disease. The uh, disease burden is variable from single sites to diffuse. Um, they could be dermal-based, subcutaneous-based, or mixed. Variable locations, extremities the most common, particularly the lower extremity, the trunk also is, exists, and also in the, in the head and neck region as well. <clears throat> so even though it's a relatively heterogeneous group of patients overall, they have some very important shared characteristics that are meaningful from a biologic perspective. They have relatively long median survival times, high risk for suffering morbidities. There is a, uh, a reported significant response to a variety of modalities that are administered in a, in a regional perspective, Rel relatively limited response to a variety of systemic therapies, although we are getting more information about the new novel therapies that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, they have a high risk of developing distant metastatic disease, as stated before. There's a paucity of prospective randomized trials to assess treatment efficacy for these patients, and there's easy access to tumor for direct injections. So the treatment options are variable. Uh, surgery for very limited disease is certainly reasonable. 
uh, for very extensive uncontrollable disease that's very symptomatic. People have used amputation. doesn't have an impact on survival, though, but certainly very good for local regional disease control, but certainly very mutilating. There are topical agents like imiclomod and a skin sensitizing agent that's used mostly in Australia called diphencyprone. Um, systemic therapy has been used, um, and so it can be used as a, as a primary treatment modality, and if they're BRAF positive, then they can have a BRAF, a BRAF mech got combination. IL-2 has been used, biochemotherapy has been used, some of the checkpoint blocking agents have been used, and obviously a clinical trial would be the most useful for these patients. Um, adjuvant after resection, if it's resectable, or adjuvant after regional chemotherapy, like, like um, isolated limb perfusion, if you can control the disease, some sort of adjuvant is relevant in these patients, like interferon or a clinical trial. Uh, extremity regional chemotherapy has been the main state for, for a lot of these patients using isolated limb perfusion or isolated limb infusion. Response rates are high, toxicity is manageable, uh, not very durable responses, unfortunately, and probably has very little impact on what happens at the systemic level. And then the last that has emerged as a very reasonable and rational option for these patients is direct intralesional injection or ablation, mostly for the stage 3B and 3Cs, but also for the stage 4 patients with limited visceral tumor burden. So that brings us to the issue of intralesional therapy or oncolytic immunotherapy. And it was interesting that I didn't really think, think about it this way, but humans write it's, the, um, it's, it's a type of gene therapy, and we'll get to the viruses in a second, but we don't usually consider it a type of gene therapy because you're not modifying the genome of the, of the tumor or the host. The, the agent that's been modified genetically is what, is, 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 is what underwent gene therapy. But from an, immuno, from an immunotherapy perspective, it's a locally ablative therapy for local disease control. You can inject high concentration, uh, high local concentration. You can achieve high local concentration to ablate tumor. And it can control the patient's symptoms or provide expectant palliation. And also, hopefully, and this is the important part of the therapy, is that it induces a systemic host immune anti-tumor activity that may be very specific. Um, it, this, uh, and this activity could also augment the local injected response. You can see responses in distant and uninjected regional metastases. In a sense, it can function as a systemic adjuvant response, and it has very limited toxicity. There are a couple mechanisms of action. It can be direct cell lysis, either by vir viral replication or ablation using a chemical or mechanical ablation, like electroporation can be an indirect bystander, you can have an indirect response, what we call a bystander response through the induction of the innate immune response as well as induction of the adaptive specific immune response. Variety of agents have been looked at, BCG a long time ago, cytokines have been looked at, electro, uh, electrochemotherapy, which is electroporation plus the use of bleomycin or cisplatinum, mechanical ablation using cryo or laser or electrocautery even, chemical ablation, particularly res Rose Bengal, which we'll talk about in a minute, called PD-10. And then lastly, the oncolytic viruses, but you know, specifically herpes simplex virus and then Coxsackie virus. <clears throat> so we have to kind of look at these therapies in the context of the new evolving landscape and the treatment of advanced melanoma. There's been recent approval of BRAF MEK inhibitors, um, and checkpoint blocking agents for unresectable stage 3 and stage 4. In the last five years, there are 10 new regimens that have been approved for advanced melanoma. It's pretty amazing. And exciting data with combination checkpoint blocking therapy, this is the most active and most recently approved of all the, uh, of all the therapies for metastatic melanoma. And recently a reported randomized trial, the oncolytic immunotherapy TVEC, and it's now the first in-class approval that uh, human Fong had talked about, and this was back in October of 2015. So let's look at some of the other therapies so we can kind of get a sense of what kind of response patients get so we can compare that to what we get with the oncolytic viruses, uh, which, are, which are very, very well tolerated. So this is from the Checkmate 067 trial, which was an anti-PD-1 drug plus an anti-CTLA-4, so it was Ipinevo study, combination with a lot of toxicity. Um, and, if you, and if you look at the three different graphs, you can see the best change from baseline. These are all waterfall plots. You can see Nevo alone is about 34%. Ipinevo is almost 52%. 
amazing, never seen things like this before in melanoma. Nipilumumab is a, 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 not, not a very active drug in terms of obvious response, but has an impact on survival, though, and that's um, around, around 6%. Oops, sorry. So if we look at um, adverse effects, though, the combination therapy, which is the most active, so the Ipinevo, has a 40% uh, grade, three, grade 3 and 4 um, uh, uh, adverse events. And so significant um, drug toxicity with this um, uh, particular therapy. So why even talk about local regional therapy for regionally metastatic disease when we have all these active regimens, right? Well, there's limited experience for this particular patient population with the new systemic therapies. Although you can get a robust response with BRF inhibition, particularly at the systemic level, most of these are not durable. There's, a, there's actually a pretty low response rate with ibilumumab systemically. Uh, all these therapies have some sort, of thus, uh, some sort of side effects. Some of them very serious, and, and uh, some of them can be fatal, and some of them very long-lasting with significant impact on their quality of life, such as hypopituitarism for the, for the, for the, for the rest of their life. Uh, relatively high response rate we see for these patients with regionally administered uh, agents, like isolated limb perfusion, for example, and surgery for limited disease and regional therapies are actually very, very well tolerated. So there's rationale to have a discussion about alternative therapies for this particular patient population. So intralesional therapy, so who are the good candidates? Well, readily injectable lesions, obviously, by direct vision and palpation or with ultrasound guidance. These patients should have limited distant uh, disease and uh, no active brain mets. There is a group of elderly patients who would be eligible for these therapies who wouldn't be eligible for the other therapies because of significant comorbidities, and these they would tolerate very, very well. Patients who have failed other frontline therapies, and also consideration in a neoadjuvant setting can be rendered NED with surgery after treatment. So understand that you can't use these agents in the adjuvant setting. You can only use them in the neoadjuvant setting because that's where they have their effect. You have to inject the tumor to get an immune response. So the only way to use them if you're going to combine it with surgery would be in a neoadjuvant setting. So the, I'm going to talk about three agents but mostly about the two that I've actually dealt with directly using uh, in, 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 uh, in the um, um, pivotal clinical trials. So there's Coxsackie A21 virus, which, which is an ongoing phase two trial. And these are the three agents that are proven to have local effects as well as bystander responses. PV10 is a, a chemical rose bengal 10%, phase two completed, and there's a phase two opening combination, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And um, there's also a phase three versus one of the chemotherapeutic agents as well for patients who have failed the checkpoint blocking agents. TVEC is the one that recently got approved, which uh, you had already talked about, and that was a phase three uh, trial. It's initially called Oncovex GMCSF, and this is the one that was pr approved. So the concept of oncolytical immunotherapy is designed to produce local and systemic effects, and people talk about the hypothesis of the cancer immune cycle. So the cancer immune cycle starts by somehow manipulating the tumor or ablating the tumor or destroying the tumor in a necrotic way as opposed to an apoptotic way. The inflammatory response that's created by a cell death that's necrotic uh, uh, brings in cytokine reaction, uh, all, these, all, all the inflammatory responses, then dendritic cells get primed. Antigens that are neoantigens that have not been exposed before are exposed now. The antigens, when this necrosis occurs, are not denatured, so they're available to be presented on den uh, dendritic cells, which then prime T cells. The T cells <laughs> then are expanded, uh, circulate, uh, they're specific CD8s, hopefully, and they infiltrate into tumor, which destroys tumor again, and then with this cycle, and the cycle continues. So it's an interesting concept to believe in, if it's true, where this cycle gets initiated by the destruction of the tumor by some sort of manipulation. So let's first talk about PV, PV10, or uh, Rose Bengal, which was initially an, uh, a diagnostic agent that was used by radiologists and also by ophthalmologists. It's uh, taken up by cells very avidly, and it's taken up by the um, lysosomes, which are then destroyed and release their 
lytic enzymes and then cause um, uh, um, destruction of the cell. So the autologous is complete within usually 30 to 60 minutes. Because of the fat content, usually with uh, tumor cells, the PV10 gets taken up avidly into the tumor cells more strongly than into normal cells. Uh, there are tumor infiltrating lymphocytes at the local site that, um, uh, that are seen, and uh, you can see regression of distant tumors occasionally. Uh, necrotic tumor cells will facilitate, as I mentioned, antigen presentation. Secondary tumors are reject rejected in immunocompetent animals. So in preclinical models, secondary tumors are rejected in, in, in animals that are, that are immunocompetent. There's no, immune re there's no immune response in immunocompromised animals. Uh, the response is very tumor specific, and the adoptive transfer of spleen cells from mice, for example, can convey immunity into, into, um, into, into healthy animals and protect them from, the, from uh, having, having, having an injected tumor, tumor growth. This is a B16 melanoma murine model that was actually developed at, um, at Moffitt Cancer Center where they took mice and did subcutaneous tumors with head, and also a model that had pulmonary metastases as well. They treated the primary tumor the, or the, the flank tumor with PV-10 that caused regression of the treated tumor, regressed in size and number of the pulmonary metastases. Splenocytes taken from those animals from treated mice had increased production of gamma interferon, uh, increased in vitro lysis of B16, to, of B16 cells with the, with the T cells from the animals, and then transfer of T cells from that animal resulted in delay of tumor growth in other animals. So some preclinical evidence to suggest that it that would have some sort of immune response. And here's an example of an elderly individual who has that lesion on his cheek but has three other sites of subcutaneous metastases on his scalp. And the only lesion that was injected was the one on the face. And you can see the rose color of the, uh, of the agent. Actually, it causes photosensitivity, so you have to be careful with that. Um, it causes a relatively quick disruption of the, of the, of the tumor, causes ulceration and an eschar. And in this particular patient, the tumor went away and all the other sites went away as well. So there was no injection of the other, of the other sites. So this individual clearly had a bystander response. A phase two trial of 80 patients that we participated in that was finished and reported about three years ago. Uh, this combined partial response, complete response, and stable disease, that was 64% of the patients that were injected. There was a 32% bystander response that was linked to local response, meaning that if you didn't get a good local response, you didn't get a systemic response. So almost all the individuals that had a bystander response had a, had a very strong um, local response. It's a very well-tolerated approach. You just inject them in the clinic. Uh, there's local pain, there's ulceration, and there's the issue about photosensitivity. It's clearly a very well-tolerated. So let's move from PV-10 for a minute and talk about the, the most uh, studied drug so far, which is telemagine lachaparapvac. It took me six months to learn how to pronounce that. And so it's easier to say TVEC. Okay, uh, so it's an HS, HSV uh, 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 type 1 um, uh, virus that is uh, genetically engineered to make GMCSF. It's also genetically engineered only to replicate within tumor cells. So that's the genetic engineering part of the, of the, of the therapy or the gene therapy part. Uh, there's a dual mode of action, we think, like with PV-10. There's local oncolytic tumor destruction and a systemic anti-tumor response. It's not clear. So it's interesting. Um, humans showed in the mesothelioma model with the virus that the, you would inject, uh, that the virus would be taken up by tumor, the tumor would get destroyed, the virus would go on to attack other tumor cells. We don't think that's what happens with TVEC because it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an irradiated virus and it just replicates within the tumor and when you biopsy the other tumors as they're regressing, we don't see any virus in those tumors. So we think that whatever bystander response there is, it's likely some sort of systemic response. So there's some really interesting preclinical models with TVEC as well. So this is a bi-flank uh, mouse model where uh, you have injections of tumors on each side of the mouse and you inject one of them with a mouse TVEC. Interestingly enough, there is mouse TVEC. There's also mouse GMCSF, believe it or not. And um, so you can see on the graph, where's the, uh, okay. So you can see on the graph, so this is the control that, you know, um, 
the control tumor continues to grow, and you can see that um, this is this this graph is the um, uh, t t tumor responding with and without GMCSF. So it seems to be stronger, a little bit stronger local response with GMCSF, but not really. But if you look at the contralateral tumor, though, the delay in growth or the reduction. Let me get you in the head there, Kyle. There you go. It's like a laser pointer. Um, that this is with GMCSF and this is without GMCSF, and this is the this is the this is the control. So you can see the tumor on the other side, the contralateral tumor responds and responds better in the in the in the in the presence of GMCSF. So this is a different model. So this is a, 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 a different tumor model, but it shows that there's memory. So this is, this is um, mice that were treated with the original model and then, and then responded. And then they tried to challenge the mice again with, a, with another tumor. And you can see the untreated mice, oops, the untreated mice, sorry, the untreated mice um, grow tumors. The mouse that responded to therapy before, there's memory, the tumor doesn't grow. And this is a tail vein injection of a mouse uh, that, was, that was treated and responded, that the um, liver metastasis don't grow, but in the, in the naive mouse, uh, a tail injection causes tumor growth within, with, within the liver. So evidence, at least in a preclinical model, that there's some sort of systemic immunity that's being created by the, by the injection of the TVAC. So this is, the, this is the OPTIM trial. This is the pivotal trial. OPTIM stands for Oncovex Pivotal Trial in Melanoma. It's a phase three randomized trial for stage 3B, uh, 3C, and 4 uh, melanoma patients, uh, randomized in a two-to-one fashion to injections of TVEC into the tumor versus GMCSF given subcutaneously. Uh, how the uh, NCI approved that uh, was amazing, but great for for the approval of the drug because no one thought that GMCSF was going to have much of, much of an impact, even though it may have had some adjuvant effect in a previous, in a previous trial. This just shows the characteristics of the randomization where the, the randomization is pretty much spot, spot on, so there's no imbalance of any important stratified prognostic factors. Uh, it's also, you can see that surprisingly, it's not a, it's not a, it's, it's a, it's most of the patients that we think would respond are the three B's and three C's are part of the trial, obviously, but it's a very advanced patient population. You can see 27%, 21%, and 22% were for the stage fours, respectively. But they obviously all had to have injectable lesions. It's a very safe uh, therapy, essentially no, no, no um, uh, grade three or four toxicities whatsoever. Uh, if you look at the primary endpoints and overall response, so overall response was a uh, secondary endpoint. The primary endpoint was this new, new endpoint called durable response rate for six months or greater. So they had to achieve a durable response for more than six months. And you can see uh, that was much better in the TVEC arm compared to the GMCSF arm. And you can see the overall response is much greater with the TVEC than in the um, 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 uh, GMCSF. Interesting, almost half of the patients that responded were actually complete responders. The other interesting thing is the time point of response, which also leads one to believe that this is an, that this is an, 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 an immuno, immunotherapy somewhat, because there's in many patients, almost half of the ones that had durable response progressed before they responded. So there was some progression of lesions or new lesions that developed on therapy but the way the trial was written, as long as the treating physician felt that there was no significant um, progression that would have effect on their quality of life, the patients could continue on the trial. And thank God that was in there because half of the patients who developed durable response actually progressed before they responded. And, uh, oh, there we go. So now if we look at the lesion level responses by type. So the top graft is injected tumors. The second graph, the second waterfall plot, is bystander response in uninjected lesions that were non-visceral. And the third waterfall plot is uninjected lesions that were located in the visceral area. So you can see a very nice response locally, a pretty reasonable bystander response regionally, and about 15% of the patients had a response at um, distance sites. 
Here's an example of one of the patients that was actually on the Optum trial. This was an interesting patient because she had Crohn's disease, and although it was pretty quiescent, but wouldn't have been eligible for some other immunotherapeutic agents. She had also undergone several surgeries of resection and also isolated limb perfusion. Initially had a really good response to perfusion, but then exploded on her leg like this, and we put her on the TVEC trial. Unfortunately, she got randomized to the TVEC, and you can see the circles are the sites that were injected. So you can see a small percentage of the lesions were actually injected. And uh, over time, um, she developed a, essentially a complete response. There are these four little things, ulcerations that were left over that I actually removed in the operating room to see if there's any viable tumor, and all we found were T cells. So um, an, an interesting example of a um, type of response to this agent. Here's a patient, uh, had a couple sites injected, one in the neck there on the left and then one in the subcutaneous tissue. So the green, the, um, the green arrows are injections. The other uh, yellow arrows are sites that were not injected that actually responded over time. So you can see significant bystander response at quite a distance from the site of the original injection. So this patient obviously had good injection response and had good response at the other, at the other sites. Here's a lung metastasis uh, in one patient that went away as well. So the final overall survival analysis, you can see that there is a plateau in both arms and suggesting that GMCSF may do something in some patients or that this is a very favorable group, but we know that that's not the case based on the original constellation of patients. You can see a near, um, a, a near uh, kind of a overall survival impact in terms of being nearly significant I think this one was 0.049, but the, the one that was submitted to the FDA was actually 0.051, actually. But that's not the primary endpoint of the study. The primary endpoint had already been reached based on durable response, but this was kind of a bonus to see a trend for improved overall survival. And actually, the survival by the landmark graph actually got better over time, was more pronounced over time. So if you look at the key covariates that were important in exploratory analysis about which patients actually were deriving the benefit from an overall survival, it was the, it was the uh, d uh, disease stages 3B and 3C, and um, also may maybe the M1As, and um, uh, also if it was given as first line of therapy. So the two most important, co co um, important covariates that predicted a response from a survival perspective were the earlier stage disease, the 3Bs and 3Cs, and also, also the M1As, and if it, was, if it was also frontline therapy. So if you do the exploratory and look at frontline and also look at second line, you can see the frontline significant improvement in survival if it was given in frontline. And this is 3Bs, 3Cs, and 4, M4, M1A four, all, all bunched together with a significant improvement in survival compared to the, to the pure stage four patients, you know, four M M M1Bs and Cs, the more advanced patients, uh, not really deriving a, a, a survival advantage. So now if we look back and, um, and look at TVEC in terms of obje objective response in this patient population, TVEC has a 52% response rate, ipilimumab is less than 30% with some limited data, and there's almost no data using the PD-1 inhibitors and it's, it, what's listed is, um, or what's reported is around 27%. So if you look at the new novel therapies and bring them into this patient population, it looks like TVEC kind of stands up pretty well uh, in relationship to these therapies and much better tolerated for sure, for sure. So TVEC is the first oncolytic immunotherapy to demonstrate therapeutic benefit against melanoma in well-controlled randomized stage 3 trial. The systemic effect of TVEC is demonstrated by responses in uninjected regional and distant lesions, and TVEC monotherapy provides a novel potential therapeutic approach for metastatic melanoma. And the exploratory uh, survival analysis would suggest the patients who benefit the most would be the ones treated frontline and also the stage 3B, 3C, and stage 4 M1A. So it's not a surprise, based on its immunologic mechanism, that people are combining this with some of the novel immunotherapies, right? To kind of finish the cancer immune cycle, right? So ipilimumab, anti-PD-1. So there's, we've already finished a trial of a randomized phase two trial of TVEC plus ipilimumab versus ipilimumab alone for the advanced melanoma patient population. 
There was a phase 1B, which was just the toxicity of the combination, and then there was the phase 2 randomized portion. That trial's actually now finished. We just finished it last month, actually. It was closed. But this is the, state, this is the 1B phase, the, just the combination safety profile. So we've never really seen rotifor plots like this, either with IPI alone or with TVEC alone. So it looks like, at least in this small group of patients, which is only 18, it looks like it could be a relatively active, uh, um, active, active combination. So there's other combinatory directions, though, that are really interesting. <coughs> So just like in the other diseases, neoadjuvant and combinatory treatment approaches with oncolytic therapies are extremely rational. So I already mentioned the, um, the TVEC, TVEC plus IPI, and that's closed. That first one is a neoadjuvant trial that actually Robert N. Baca, who's one of our previous fellows, is the PI on, where patients who have resectable stage 3, B, and C and resectable stage 4 and 1A that those patients can receive neoadjuvant TVEC for 12 weeks and then undergo resection. But this is a randomized phase two against standard of care. Standard of care would be upfront surgery followed by adjuvant. And whatever adjuvants available are part of a clinical trial. So you, obviously you can't give this drug in the adjuvant setting if we're going to have a systemic effect for resectable patients. It has to be given in the neoadjuvant setting. So then there's TVAC plus pembrolizumab, and this is actually going to be a registration trial. It's not open yet. It's a randomized phase three of TVAC plus pembrolizumab versus pembrolizumab alone. Uh, there's also a neoadjuvant trial of TVAC in unresectable stage 3B and C extremity in transit disease followed by ILI. Instead of surgery, ILI is being used to consolidate. As a matter of fact, this is an I, this is a investigator-initiated project that I sent into Amgen that I'm, I'm th I think they're going to fund where it's the, it's the parallel trial to Robert's trial. We're going to look at the unresectable in transit disease in the extremity, give them upfront TVEC, and then do um, limb perfusion as the local control consolidating mechanism. And that way, hopefully, you get a systemic effect, and hopefully, it'll enhance the local regional effect as well. There's also a phase two trial with PV10 plus anti PD1. And that's, that's recently opened, actually, and this is a single-arm phase 2 of PV10 plus anti-PD1. It's going to be pembrolizumab. And so is there a future for oncolytic immunotherapies or intralesional therapy in advanced melanoma? The answer for sure is yes. It, it's now been approved as monotherapy. Certainly there's data to suggest that it potentiates, it, it, there are potentiators of the immune response. There are neoadjuvant approaches that are, that are ongoing. Combination therapies are really interesting. Not a surprise, people are thinking about visceral injections. I mean, if we can stick a needle in it, then you can inject, then you can inject the virus in it. And actually, there is a planned uh, uh, in, a visceral injection of, of TVEC uh, trial looking at, looking at liver tumors. And that's right, there's already data with, with uh, PV10 in hepatocellular carcinoma, actually, to inject the small hepato, hepato, so hepatocellular carcinomas. But this trial is going to be for HCC and also for metastatic disease to the liver from breast cancer, colorectal cancer, melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and, and renal cell as well. Not open yet, but planned. Uh, and the, the last uh, comment is, this is Patrick Koo, actually. I don't know if you've known Patrick is. He's actually head of our melanoma medical oncology group, and he was on the... He was on the FDA advisory committee for TVEC, and his, his, his comments were, there are clearly patients in my clinic I'd like to use this for, and then he said, um, I need as many arrows as possible in my quiver. So on that note, that I'll stop, and thank you very much for your kind attention.